and please support the counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Demetrius Elder defended Armando Baptista, his friend. And the law permitted him to do so. Armando was attacked. But this wasn't just any random attack. This was a setup. This attack was revenge. It was revenge against Armando for what, had, for what Armando had done to Walter. I want to talk a little bit about Ford Dyer as well and, and, and what we talked about. Because those concepts that we discussed at length are coming full circle now back into the law and the jury instructions that Judge Carr had just read to you. And if you remember, we talked about the presumption of innocence. We talked about the state's burden. We talked about witness credibility. And everybody agreed, and that's why you are the jury that was selected. You agreed to follow the law. And we, we did, we talked about a golf example. When you're golfing and you're holding the golf club, how it may not feel right. And you have to think differently when you're in the courtroom. And you have to follow the laws that the judge, that Judge Carver just read and set out to you. Because if you don't, the judge just said, it will be a miscarriage of justice. In order to understand the events that happened on uh, April 25th, 2014, it's important to understand the events that led up to that day. And the judge told you, when you're listening and, and, and when you go back and you deliberate, it's, it's your job to, to listen, to look at your notes, to discuss, to deliberate what you heard, what the evidence was, what the testimony was. The judge said, if you're listening, you'll get the instruction. You can believe any, all, or none of what he witness said. And we talked about that in Board of the Hire. We talked, we had a discussion about, will you be a good juror? And how do you know if a witness is telling the truth or if they're telling the version, maybe that's in their head, they're not necessarily lying, but they're telling you, telling you something or testifying about something the way that they want to perceive it. And we had that discussion about seven days ago. And some of the answers that, that we got in Boyd Iyer were the exact answers that Judge Calra had just read to you about weighing the credibility of witnesses. Did the witness have an opportunity to see and know about the things in which they testified? Did they have an accurate memory? Were they honest and were they straightforward in answering the attorney's questions? Did they have an interest in them, how the case should be decided? Did their testimony agree or disagree with the other evidence and testimony that you heard? Did the witness at some time make a statement that was inconsistent with the statement that they made in court? So, so every time we're at the podium and you saw myself or co-counsel walk up to show a previous statement or to refresh their memory, that's where that instruction comes. Did they make an in, a statement inconsistent with what they said to you in the courtroom? And also whether or not they have been convicted of a felony, which we heard about Corey McMath. And those, those topics, we discussed those topics. And the reason we discussed those is because that is the law and those are the only laws that you will receive and that apply to this case. So, in order to understand the events on April 25th, as I said, let's go back in time a few months prior about what led up. And we heard firsthand from somebody that was there what led up to those events. We heard from Marlon Williams that Marlon, Walter, Walter's girlfriend, and another gentleman were together. And, and Walter and his girlfriend got into an argument or a fight. And Walter intervened. Scratch that. Armando intervened. 
Walter and his girlfriend were getting into a fight, and Armando intervened. Remember who was not there. Demetrius. So, when Walter and his girlfriend have this argument, Armando intervenes and he does a punch. It, it was described almost as a sucker punch, but he punched Armando. Armando. Armando punched Walter. And Armando's punch to Walter broke his jaw. It was not a slap. His punch broke his jaw. Pretty much everybody who testified, notwithstanding Wendy and law enforcement, Ivan, Corey, Walter, you heard from Demetrius, they, are, they all know each other. They're a circle of friends. And I think Marlon kind of described the circle of friends that, well, we have a group of friends that kind of hang out together a lot. There's another group of friends that hang out together a lot, but we, it, it overlaps. Everybody, notwithstanding really Wendy as a civilian or, or the law enforcement, everybody, they all know each other. Walter knows Armando, they know Corey, they know Demetrius, they know Marlon, they know Ivan. Everybody you heard from, notwithstanding Wendy, they know each other. And even if they were not there, you heard testimony that everybody in the circle knew about the incident when Armando sucker punched and broke Walter's jaw. We, we, we know that Corey, Corey McMahon, whose house the party was, and Walter, whose jaw were, was broken, they were cousins, right? You heard that testimony come out. They, they were cousins. So I submit to you, it is reasonable, and it makes sense, it adds up, that even if Walter is saying it's squash or it's not a big deal, that I submit to you, Corey was still upset. And, and you are going to be the judge of the witnesses. You can take Corey's testimony and give it the weight that you want on what do you believe, any, all, or none of what he said. But we know that Corey was having a pre-birthday party. We know that Corey was, was intoxicated. He told us he was drinking, he was drunk. We know that he was high. We know because he told us he was smoking weed. He wasn't even sure about the date. We're talking about April 25th. He was talking about the day before his birthday, April 27th. Wendy says that they were going to visit, when I say they, Wendy and Muhammad, the deceased, were going to go visit her mom. That doesn't add up at all with what Corey was saying, that he was calling Muhammad to come over because they were going to go shoot pool. And that doesn't make sense because they're going to go shoot pool when he's got 15 to 16 people, even though he said it's not a party, 15 or 16 people over, all drinking and having a good time out in the garage and in the front lawn. Marmon was there. Again, the group of friends. Marmon was over at Corey's house for Corey's party. Marlon is friends with Demetrius, calls Demetrius, hey, come over to the party. Demetrius just happened to be with Armando. So Demetrius gets a call from Marlon, hey, come on over. He's, he's with Armando. They go over to the house. While they're at the house, we know from Ivan, because Ivan told us in his testimony that he heard the conversation, he heard the phone call, he told us, Ivan said, Corey, Corey who's Walter's cousin, Walter, jaw broken, who was intoxicated, Ivan told us that Corey called Muhammad to come over after Armando showed up with Demetrius. Corey... Walter's cousin, whose Walter's jaw was broken, he calls Muhammad. Muhammad comes over, greets everybody. 
except for two people. He does not greet Armando, and he does not greet Demetrius. Everybody's outside in the garage, drinking, smoking, whatever, talking. What happened when, our, when, when Muhammad comes over? Muhammad and Corey, the two of them, they go into the house. They come out of the house, and Muhammad goes where? Directly up to Armando. I then said that Muhammad looked frustrated. That was his word after talking with Armando. We know that Corey called Muhammad. What we don't know is how long that conversation was, if there are any text messages. We heard from law enforcement they got phone records, none of which were introduced, but we know... Objection, we know. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, please disregard uh, my uh, defense counsel's uh, statement concerning what was not introduced we know from the detective they did not get Muhammad's records. So now we're at this party, and, 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 and Muhammad, according to Ivan's testimony, was being frustrated. He was talking or confronted Armando. So what happens? Walter. Walter, who's friends with Demetrius, what's Walter say? He tells Demetrius, you guys should go. And they do. Demetrius and Armando leave. Now we have testimony that within two minutes, as soon as Armando and Demetrius leave, who else leaves? Muhammad. We have testimony that Corey made Muhammad aware that it was Armando. So Corey is telling, he's making Muhammad aware at the house that it was Armando. It's that guy right there that broke my cousin's jaw. Pointing to Armando. Pointing him out. They're at the stop sign. And we hear, and I'm going to go into the statement of Demetrius in a few minutes, but we hear he stopped at the stop sign, he's looking for traffic, and he starts coughing, coughing, and we hear about his disease, my estate is and I'm going to read to you, and we're going to talk about what he tell, told you in his statements. We heard two statements from Demetrius, one recorded to the police, and one that's on video. And both those are available in evidence if you need to review them. But he's coughing. The state wants you to think that, our, that, that, that Muhammad gets, honks the horn, gets out of the car, and walks up to Armando to shake his hand. Okay. When you're back there and you're deliberating, think about that. The state wants you to think that Muhammad got out of the car, walked up to Armando, who he was just pointed out as breaking his friend's jaw, to shake his hand. Yet, we know from Wendy, when Muhammad got out of that car, and he's walking, and we know that it was him that walked, we have Brian Castillo, who was outside and said, I saw a guy from the back car wearing a white shirt, walking in the term he used, aggressive, to the front car. Nobody in the front car did Brian Castillo tell you to get out. And Brian Castillo said, I told my kids to come in because I felt that something may be going down. What does Wendy say, Muhammad said? Hey, nice to meet you? No. As he's walking, what does Muhammad say? Walt! Walt! Walt 
Paul's heart. He was there for revenge on Walter. And that is why Wendy said when he got out of the car and he's walking to the front part to where Armando is, he's yelling, Walter. He's not there to shake his hand. Use your common sense. He yelled, Walt, whose jaw was broken by the guy he's going to confront. This was a revenge. This was set up. Muhammad was there. Muhammad was there to fight Armando. <clears throat> we heard from Demetrius Seltzer. We heard him testify two times, both on tape and on video. And as I said, both are available for you. But what do we hear Demetrius say? And I'm going to preface it with, as you're listening to what I'm going to tell you, what he said. That I was taking good notes. That what Demetrius says adds up and makes sense to everything else you heard. It's like a big puzzle. You have a puzzle. A hundred piece puzzle. You dump it out. You take little pieces and you do the board. You take pieces and you start putting them in. And the more little pieces of the puzzle, the more testimony about this, or here, or here, or here, the more puzzle pieces that come together, what happens? You can see the big picture. And you see what really went down. Demetrius starts out by telling, in his statement, about his disease that he has called Manastavius Gravis. And, and the jury instruction will actually tell you that you can consider the capacity in, in deciding self-defense of another, the relevant capabilities of the parties involved. We heard Judge Carver read that, and you'll have a copy of that. But he says, he says to Detective Toyota that imagine being as big as you are but, but having the strength of, of a baby. He says, my Anastasius Gravis is what I have. And what it does, it puts something in your blood that blocks your muscles from basically doing what your nerves say. So you have a muscle that makes you breathe too. I guess that's how I got it, that, that I couldn't breathe. Demetrius, in this statement that was presented to you, tells you about Walter fighting with his, with his wife and about Armando being there and Armando breaking Walter's jaw. How? Demetrius wasn't there. Everybody in the circle of friends knew about this. Armando and Walter, they weren't as close as they were. Okay, well that adds up. That makes sense. Armando sucker punched Walter and broke his jaw. And then he talks about they were going to go see Marlon, right? They were going to go see Marlon at Corey's house because Marlon called. And March, Armando, we heard testimony that Armando nickname is March, M A R C H. And Demetrius testified and told the detectives March and I drove to Corey's house. And as we got there, Marlon was leaving. And we heard from Marlon. He was leaving. Marlon didn't witness what happened. Marlon, I think he, he, he testified he left to go get some food at Hooters. And we were standing right there. Armando was standing in the grass because he had tried to talk to Walt. And Walt was like, whatever. He didn't want to talk to him. Armando had apologized like so many times to him saying that, you know, he should not have gotten involved. And Armando apologized. I'd say like 10 minutes may have passed at most. 
and another guy, this guy, I've never seen this guy before, he came. He spoke to like all of them. He didn't know me. He didn't know March. So he didn't speak to either of us. He walked into Corey's house. Okay? That's consistent with what we heard from Ivan. He walked through the garage and then he spoke with Corey for a few minutes. Then he came out. And when he came out, he walked up to March. And again, he was trying to figure out who he was. He asked, so this is Muhammad asking March, where did I know you from? What do they call you? And March was just telling him, you don't know me. I don't know you. He said the name, I think. So then the guy walked away from March, or Armando, and walked up to Walter. So, so, so now, Muhammad was in Corey's house, walks out, walks up to March, says, who are you? What's your name? What do they call you? Muhammad was, I don't know you. You don't know me. Now Muhammad's walking up to Walter. I was standing beside Walter, but he walked up to Walter. He pulled Walter to the side. They had a conversation at the time. I didn't, I didn't know what the conversation was. The detective, Detective Toyota, said, you couldn't hear it? Yeah, I couldn't hear it, but I do know when they finished their conversation and before the guy walked back up to Armando, he said, and I apologize, but I am not going to sugarcoat any language. This is real life. This is, you know, language that is used, so I'm going to use it. But he said, these niggers got the game fucked up. And he walked back to Armando. And then again, he asked him, you sure I don't know you? I don't know you from anywhere. And Armando again was like, nah, I don't know you. Then Walter pulled me to the side and Walter said, man, why'd you even bring that nigga around here? You don't know, you don't even know what you got. You got set up. I don't know, why'd you, why'd you bring that nigga around here? You don't even know. He said, Corey, you got set up. Demetrius told you in his statement that he felt something was wrong. We got in the car and we left. At the stop sign, maybe about 100 feet or so, I mean, it's not that far. I pulled up to the stop sign, and then when I looked left for the traffic, and the next thing you know, I feel like the car was kind of moving, and I hear Armando saying, D, D, Demetrius, D, you know this dude? Or he actually said, D, you know this nigger? Do you know me? And I took over, and, there was a, and I looked over, I looked over, and there was a dude on top of March. So I get out of the car and I go around the back of the car. There's a car behind our car, or, or, or behind my car, and there's a lady standing. She had got out, but she was standing right there at the driver's side. I'm trying to pull the guy off, off Armando, and it's the same shit with this. I was the same way. I really wasn't doing much to affect the situation. I wasn't doing anything to him. And he was still hitting March, and he had something in his hand. You could tell it was a bottle. Like a bottle that had been broken. And he's on top of March, punching, punching him. And I was behind him trying to hold his arms, like trying to not let him punch March. And then, I, I don't know how long this went on, but not long. I mean, probably, I guess, a good 20, 30 seconds. I don't know, but Armando started screaming, D, he's trying to kill me. 
he's trying to cut my throat. A second time, he's trying to cut my throat. And then again, I got on top of him, trying to pull his arm so he couldn't do anything. Mark, and, and, and there, I mean, I couldn't. So at the same time, while I'm trying, I looked, I looked at the passenger floorboard, and there was a knife. I mean, I guess it unfolded, maybe this long, maybe something. I, I don't know. It looked like it was a work knife that you would just carry around. I picked up the knife. And even when I picked up the knife, I kept trying to get the dude off Armando, but he didn't. And then, and then I stabbed him in his lower back somewhere. And I stabbed him in his lower back. And then he got off Armando and he backed up. Backed out of the way. And they leave. And Walter calls Demetrius to try to say, he acted on his own. Listen to the statement. He acted on his own. I didn't have, I didn't, I didn't set you guys up. Muhammad was acting on his own. And Armando calls Marlon. Right? Because Marlon called them over. Remember, Marlon is the one who called D, Demetrius. Hey, Demetrius, why don't you come over to the party? Demetrius shows up with Armando. Lo and behold, not everybody was happy that Demetrius showed up with Armando. Not that Demetrius showed up, but Armando showed up. But it was Marlon who had called Demetrius. So what's Armando do? Armando calls Marlon. Your homeboys tried to kill me. That was what Marlon testified to immediately after. And he said multiple times, Armando, your homeboys tried to kill me. <clears throat> they drive off. Demetrius doesn't do anything with this car. He doesn't go and, 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 and have it wiped down and cleaned and, and anything. There was testimony that he took pictures. He's trying to preserve the scene. Wendy, in her statement, her very first statement, very first time she is speaking to law enforcement, to a police officer, says nothing. Nothing. Nothing about Demetrius punching or kicking Muhammad. Let me repeat that. The first time she's with law enforcement, the first time, most fresh in her mind, she says nothing about Demetrius punching or kicking. And she never says that she saw Demetrius with a bottle. So we have a bottle. And, and, and you heard, let me back up, you heard from Officer Peluso, who was at that time crime scene technician Peluso. And she talks about how she processed the scene, she takes pictures, she takes fingerprints, right? We heard testimony about taking fingerprints. We heard that testimony. We heard testimony about all these swabs that she did. Chris Comar from the Broward Sheriff's Office line, crap, line, crime lab comes in and testifies about what? One. One. That could have been saliva on the spout 
of a beer bottle. Wendy, who was watching the entire incident, never said Demetrius ever touched that beer bottle. How about the rest of the beer bottle? Can I hold it? The spout is the only, 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 only thing in evidence that you have from the fingerprints that were collected, from the DNA that was swabbed. You have the spout. Dr. Kuzman. They said that Muhammad was walking up after he honked the horn to go shake Armando's hand. And that he had a solo cup. And that who's going to go fight or revenge with a solo cup? A solo cup that was found by Officer Cluso about three houses down where Corey was found for Captain Corey. But nevertheless, he was on marijuana. He was on alcohol, 0.08, the legal limit for being intoxicated. He was on cocaine. He was on flocka. He was on all four of those. And detective, sorry, uh, 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 toxicologist Gary Kuhnman came in and explained to you what effects, because he has actually studied those effects in his career on, on what those are. Are they stigmas? Are, are they depressants? And how they react to somebody's body. So let's review what Dr. Koonsman told you. We, he, he told you that marijuana is a depressant. Coke, so, so you have a depressant in the system. He told you that cocaine is a stigmat. He told you that flaca can create hallucinations, paranoia, it can make people feel no pain. He talked about a study where, where, where five to six police officers, it took five to six just to subdue one person on Flocka. He talked about how it could give you high, in the, in the, uh, m malignant hyperthermia, where you could sweat a lot. Okay, well, that's consistent with what Wendy was saying, how he was sweating a lot. And it could give somebody superhuman strength, which is consistent with Armando stabbing six, five or six times, and he doesn't stop. Armando stabbed him during the fight, and he didn't stop. The knife falls. Demetrius is trying to break it up. Hold his arm. He's not able to. He looks on the floorboard. He picks up the knife and he does a stab wound. One to the back. That we heard. That we heard from Dr. Boyko. That he never said the word fatal. He said it was a dangerous. That's the word he used. It was a dangerous stab wound. One, because Muhammad kept fighting and punching and going after Armando because this was revenge. Make no mistake about it. He was not there to shake his hand. He was not there yelling Walt because he was friends with Armando. He was there because this was a setup to fight Armando for breaking Walter's jaw. Nothing else. The law says a person is justified. Demetrius Elder is justified in using deadly force if he reasonably believes such force is necessary to prevent imminent death or great bodily harm to himself or another. If Demetrius was not engaged in an unlawful activity, absolutely no evidence. We know he, he was not, I submit to you. 
and was attacked in a place where he had a right to be, a car on the street, he had no duty to retreat and had the right to stand his ground and meet force with force, including deadly force. If he reasonably believed that it was necessary to do so to prevent death or great bodily harm to himself or another. Demetrius Elder is not guilty. Thank you.